Hi everyone, welcome to Biogeography Week 4. Um, I hope you all are doing well. Um, let's get started with uh, the week. So, um, just to go back to uh, question of the week, week 2, I wanted to go over some of the results that uh, you all offered. So thanks for everyone for answering this question and uh, some common themes from what is evolution. Um, most of you mentioned the word change or had the word change in your definition. Change over time was another uh, thing that a lot of you all said. Uh, adaptation was another characteristic of evolution. Change in uh, organisms uh, or species was another theme. And then uh, a number of you mentioned improvements or adaptations that led to um, better survival of an organism. Um, and these are all great answers, um, but I think that it's important to keep some things in mind when we are thinking about evolution. And so part of the reason why I asked this question and asked you not to look up the definition was to find out what was in your head already about this term and how it's used. And I think most of you grasp the term, but I want to make sure that we grasp the term as it's defined within the field so that there is just a little bit less confusion about what evolution actually is. So some things to remember given your answers. So what you should do is go back to your answer that you gave and see how it's different from the textbook definition, which is the change in allele frequencies in a population over time. Okay. Um, so uh, the thing to remember in thinking about your and rereading your definitions is that evolution can happen by three different mechanisms, not just natural selection. And as I um, mentioned in last week's lecture, and we'll talk about more uh, in this week, that we tend to think that natural selection and evolution is uh, are the same things, and they're not. Natural selection is a way in which evolution happens, is a way in which the change in allele frequencies happen, but it is not the, the exact same thing, right? So another way to think about this is that um, not all evolution happens by natural selection, okay? And I think a few of you had that definition um, that evolution is natural selection or the implication that it was. So just make sure that you're being careful about that. The other two ways that evolution can happen, as we uh, mentioned last week, were mutation and genetic drift. So make sure you go back and look at those definitions and, and listen to that part because I guarantee you're going to see a question uh, on the exam that pertains to the mechanisms of evolution. All right. Um, and so evolution, this is a really also a really important thing, is that evolution doesn't automatically result in improvements in an organism. Um, when human beings are studying evolution, we tend to pay more attention to the things, the characteristics and the changes in allele frequencies that result in change and that result in a species uh, surviving, uh, adapting to its environment. But evolution can also be maladaptive. So there's adaptive evolution evolution that results in a population being better equipped to survive um, and reproduce in an environment. But there's also uh, evolution that happens that make things harder for a population to survive and reproduce. Okay, And so evolution is uh, sort of neutral in that sense in that it is not, it doesn't automatically result in improvements. Um, the, the changes in allele frequencies can actually be really bad for a population and can result in, in its extinction. Um, so just a couple of things to keep in mind about the definitions that you gave versus what the uh, textbook definition is. So go back to your definition that you, that you offered in the question of the week and make sure that you can sort of tease out the, um, the differences. And if you have any questions, um, please do come to office hours. This is just a reminder for you all um, that I'll have office hours on Zoom um, this Wednesday at 1.30 from 1.30 to 2.30. I wasn't there this past week, so apologies if folks weren't there. Um, this is the first week for uh, virtual school for kids, and um, for many of us, it was a, a big challenge, okay? But I will be there um, on Wednesdays for office hours from 1.30 to 2.30. And again, if you can't make that time, if you have other commitments, then just shoot me an email and uh, I'll be available. OK. All right. So let's talk about one mechanism of evolution, uh, natural selection. And we'll also talk about sexual selection. I'm not listing sexual selection as a mechanism of evolution because there's a bit of controversy around sexual selection, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end. But natural selection is one of those 
um, mechanisms of evolution, often mentioned evolution by natural selection. Um, that is the most well-studied mechanism of evolution, at least by human beings, right? And as I mentioned before, these two gentlemen, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace on top and Charles Darwin, a young Charles Darwin on bottom, uh, Al Dub and Chuck D, both biogeographers, both traveled uh, from Europe uh, in opposite directions, actually, and explored and collected specimens uh, in other parts of the world that were had been previously unknown to folks in, in Western Europe, uh, made lots of observations and um, came to the same conclusion independently uh, about how change in species happens. Um, and so among these early observations that they made, these are the things, the ideas that were popping into their head um, as they were going through their travels. The first observation is that many populations produce more offspring than the environment can support. Uh, we, an example of this could be if you think about uh, sea turtles uh, and how sea turtle um, females lay uh, you know, hundreds of eggs or dozens of eggs uh, in the sand and then go back into the ocean and go about their business. And then when the baby sea turtles hatch out of the eggs, they sort of have to run this gauntlet of um, predators who are ready to pick them off. And, um, you know, that's a strategy, that's an evolutionary strategy by that species to produce more offspring, knowing that most of them are not going to survive, but that some will. Um, and so this is an observation that both Charles Darwin and, and, and uh, Alfred Russell Wallace made, that um, organisms tend to produce uh, enough babies so that the mortality of those babies doesn't collapse the species. Um, and so this also leads to competition among the offspring. Um, the offspring are, are fighting and trying to survive uh, and competing against their siblings um, and then other members of their uh, age cohort for resources that are limited. Uh, another observation that Wallace and Darwin made is that individuals within a population have varying traits. And so among the offspring that are produced, no two offspring, unless they are identical twins, uh, are look alike and are exactly alike. Okay, And so there's variation, just like there's variation uh, if you have siblings, you all, unless you're twins, of course, and identical twins, you all don't look alike. You may look similar, but you, you have different uh, characteristics, slight variations um, or more slight or very stark variations between um between siblings and certainly between those who who you're not as uh, closely related and those traits lead to um, differential survival and um, differential success in uh, reproducing right and so that organisms that survive and reproduce um, pass on those traits that uh, many of many of those traits uh, have likely led to them being able to survive and reproduce, okay? And so the traits, that variation that's in a population is heritable, it's passed on to the next generation. And so that the changes in the population are due to the differential survival and reproduction, right? So going back, the offspring uh, or our generation is born, they're competing against each other, they vary in traits, um, and so some are better competitors than others, um, and those that are better competitors uh, per survive at a higher rate and reproduce uh, at a higher rate. And then those traits that allow that organism to survive at a better rate or, or, and reproduce at a higher rate is passed on to the next generation. So you get this kind of continuum of these traits uh, in multiple generations because they are successful given the environmental conditions. So the most fit organisms have more babies, and it's not that... The, the less fit organisms die out it's, or immediately or don't reproduce. It's just that the more fit ones have more offspring um, and that the traits for the best breeders and the best survivors are increasingly represented in the population over time, right? The ones that get ahead in one generation and have offspring, their offspring sort of have a head start on the other organisms whose traits that don't, the traits that don't lead to as high uh, fitness and uh, reproduction. So you've often uh, heard the term survival of the fittest, and that's a very, very common uh, way of talking about or describing natural selection. 
And, you know, it's pithy, but it's also not quite accurate. Um, because survival is only half the evolutionary goal, if you will. It's only half the story of passing on successful traits. And so it's advantageous um, to live through um, your offspring. So if you survive, that's great. But if you're not passing those traits on to the next generation, you are uh, biologically, uh, evolutionarily, a, a, a dead end. Um, now, of course there's a tendency to anthropomorphize to, to sort of apply these characteristics to human beings broadly and even other species. Um, and there's certainly ways to pass on traits uh, through culture, through, through experiences. And so we're not saying, not saying that, um, you know, if you don't reproduce, then, you know, you're, that there's something n negative about that. Um, it's just that there's less likely of your, of the traits that are contained within your genes passing on to the next generation, right? And so the, the idea of survival of the fittest, right? It's great to survive. Hopefully uh, organisms are surviving at high rates. Um, but in terms of passing on the traits that led to that survival, then there has to be some form of reproduction. There has to be some way that the traits that your genes are passed on. Passed on. And so, you know, from an evolutionary, from a strict evolutionary biology standpoint, uh, the evolutionary race of passing on one's traits um, is is essentially over once you become a grandparent, right? Because your job, as uh, as as a as an evolutionary, from an evolutionary standpoint, your job as a parent is to um, is to pass on your traits and get your offspring to the point where they can reproduce, right? Um, and again, you know, there are all sorts of studies showing uh, in human beings and in other gen in other species that having grandparents around to support the their their um, previous their children's children uh, incurs a lot of advantage for the, or for survival for those organ for for that generation. Okay, but from strictly a, a biologically stand a biological standpoint, um, survival is not the the whole story. It's uh, survival and reproduction, and then once the the offspring generation produces more offspring, then essentially the torch can be passed, um, and the job is done. Okay, all right. So in thinking about natural selection, um, natural selection is a sorting process, and for those of you all who have seen the Resident Evil movies, you will recognize um, this screenshot. Um, I won't describe it because it's pretty gruesome. But I think it's a very good example of, of, of thinking about um, natural selection. And so the important thing to remember is that there's no specific objective of natural selection. It's not trying to create organisms that look a certain way or act a certain way or feed on a certain thing. It just is. It is a way in which um, members of a population are sorted into different categories and differential survival and reproduction. So it's not trying to make natural selection is not trying to make a particular species, the filter with which those organisms pass through, um, you know, isn't isn't designed in any particular way. Um, and the reason for this is that environments are constantly changing, right? And so, the ways in which members of a population are sorted change over time. Um, and so, for example, one year it might be um, that the environment is structured in a way that organisms with that prefer to eat at dusk um, have more food available to them and they re reproduce. But it might be in five generations, the environment changes such that the organisms that feed at dawn have, a, have an advantage, okay? And so because environments are constantly changing, the filter with which the populations are going through is also changing. So organisms survive um, the filter based on their genes, right? Based on the traits that they have, and then also based on the environments that are there. And so some organisms survive in better health um, and thus are able to uh, reproduce um, and their re reproduction doesn't suffer. And then for some organisms, um, they're at less of, a, of an advantage and so they can't put as much energy into reproduction. And so they are at an evolutionary disadvantage, okay? Um, but it's really important to remember that natural selection doesn't have a goal. It doesn't, it's not trying to create any uh, particular type of species. You can't necessarily look at 
you know, the process of natural selection and say, oh, it's trying to make big organisms because the environment is going may change um, quickly or it, may, it definitely will change over time. And then you'll have a different a different result. OK. All right. So there's different components within natural selection. OK. So remember, natural selection is a component of evolution. And now we're going to talk about the components of natural selection. So what makes up this sorting process? What what are some of the things in, that are involved? And as I mentioned before, there's competition. All right. So we can talk about competition as intra specific competition versus inter specific competition. And so when we're talking about intra specific competition, we're talking about competition within a particular species. Right. So you can think of this as um, you know, siblings of the same parents fighting over a toy, right? That would be intra-specific competition uh, versus uh, competition between species. Uh, so a way to think about this is, um, you know, lions and hyenas fighting over a wildebeest that has been that has been taken down by one of those. That's inter-specific competition, competition between two different species. All right. So that's a really important thing. And there's we'll talk more in detail about that. Uh, another component of natural selection, another component of the sorting process that results in changes in allele frequencies within a population is predation. Um, and we'll talk about uh, predation um, in detail in a bit as well. So that's a sorting process that affects prey and predators. OK, and so the prey are in this continual process of trying to adapt to avoid better avoid predators. And predators are in an evolutionary process where they are continuously trying to adapt to be better hunters, better, better consumers of those organisms. And that has some really interesting um, uh, evolutionary traits that pop up. And so we talk about that in terms of coevolution, right? The the process of prey trying to avo avoid predators and predators trying to capture their prey. Now, another component of selection. And as I mentioned before, there's uh, a lot of discussion around this and, and some disagreement about this is sexual selection. So we're talking about organisms uh, that change due to competition for mates. Right. So we can think of some of the um, the elaborate sort of plumage that we see in um, uh, bird species like peacocks. We can think about the 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 large sexual dimorphism, the difference between the size of males and females in elephant seals um, and these sorts of things, these traits that are specific to the sex uh, of the organism that result in differential competition for mates and differential successful reproduction. OK, um, so here's a video or here's a um, picture of and I think many of you know what uh, organism this is. This is a uh, giant Asian hornet, and they, their more popular term is a murder hornet. Um, and I have a video uh, that shows a really fantastic and really awesome um, uh, co-evolution uh, between uh, Asian hornets and uh, Asian honeybees. Um, and it's the result of a long process of co-evolution. Um, and so what I want you all to do right now is to pause the lecture um, and go to eCampus and click on the video of the uh, uh, giant hornet and the honeybee and watch that and then come back to the lecture. OK, and we'll talk about that in more detail in terms of um, in terms of coevolution. All right. So I'll see you all in a bit. All right. Are we back? Great. So that was pretty bonkers, huh? Um, I always uh, like it to, to I always like when I show this video in class and to watch everyone's face because um, I've yet to show this video and not have somebody have their mouth just drop open and be like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that. Um, and so this is a really fantastic example of coevolution of an adaptation that uh, prey species has had to prevent or to reduce the chances of being predated upon. Um, and so let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. And what's interesting about this is that the, you know, the Japanese honeybees in this case, 
react to the hornet, to the giant hornet, the same way your body reacts to a pathogen. Um, and that really important point that the honeybees have a heat tolerance, a maximum heat tolerance of about two degrees higher than the, uh, than the uh, giant hornet. All right, and so that's a really important feature that uh, is a result of coevolution. Uh, the honeybees, you know, through probably awful trial, trial and error, figured out the best strategy to deal with the um, hornet scouts, and it's been pretty successful. Now, of course, it doesn't work 100% of the time, um, but it is much more effective than um, the ways in which. Uh, non-Asian honeybees, non-East Asian honeybees um, deal with hornets. And this is really important because, um, as you all have seen in the news, that the giant Asian hornet is actually has actually made it to North America. So, you know, you can imagine that the uh, honeybee species that are here, and most of those honeybees are uh, in, were imported from Europe with European colonization, um, those, hor those honeybees have had no experience with giant hornets. And um, so, you know, the, the, the peril that honeybee populations are already under with pesticides and industrial farming and climate change is about to get a lot worse with um, uh, the, the, uh, the presence of giant Asian hornets in North America. Um, I also have this. This is a picture of uh, some of you might know who this is. Coyote Peterson. He's a um, he has his own YouTube channel and he's a sort of an animal presenter. And one of the insane things that he has done uh, is uh, sting is take uh, purposely take a sting from the most um, painful stinging insects in the world. And here he is. Uh, reacting to after purposefully stinging himself with a giant hornet. So you can check out that video on YouTube as well. Just type in Coyote Peterson giant hornet um, and you can watch him writhe around in pain. Um, and, you know, he does this to demonstrate uh, what these organisms, how these organisms um, uh, affect the body, affect the human body. Um, so, yeah, there's a little bit of, of masochism for you. Um, and so getting back to this kind of reaction, this is also, you know, the fact that honeybees react to the same way that of, of an invader that your body does shows you that this is a very successful evolutionary strategy that exists across species, right? Um, and at different scales. So your fever is your body's way of killing or weakening pathogens because most of the organisms that would invade your body, the microorganisms that would invade your body, and um, and harm you don't have uh, heat tolerances as high as your own heat tolerance, right? And so it's important <clears throat> that if you get a fever um, and if you get a mild fever um, uh, and that you you don't have sort of any other symptoms, then it's probably a good idea not to take Tylenol or um, these other drugs that reduce the fever because that's reducing your body's ability to fight off the infection. Now, a couple of caveats. I am not, I do not have a medical degree, so I'm not offering this as any definitive medical advice. This is just based on the, 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 the science of how, of how your body works, of physiology. I will also say that it's particularly important that, uh, should you get even just a mild fever, um, that it is important to uh, treat it as if you might have COVID-19, okay? Because one of the symptoms of COVID is a mild fever and not very severe fever. Um, people who are infected with this virus, uh, the CDC statistics show that their fevers tend not, tend not to be that high, okay? Um, and so, you know, under normal circumstances, without a pandemic, um, and as long as you're not presenting other feet, other um symptoms, um, it's probably a good idea to let your body do what it was designed to do to fight off an infection. Um, but we are in a pandemic where uh, a deadly virus, um, you know, can cause mild fever. And so you should take that very seriously. Um, but it's just sort of interesting to think about these sorts of things. And before, um, 
you know, going to school and earning a degree in biology, I always thought that any type of fever whatsoever was bad and that you should take medicine to get rid of the fever. Um, but oftentimes the medicines that, that you might take to, to get, to get rid of a fever are really only designed to make you feel better, but they're not actually fighting off the infection. Okay. Um, so just something to keep in mind. And so this whole process, both in your body and in, um, the case of the uh, honeybee and encounters with giant hornets is this sort of thing of this is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. And that's essentially the the uh, evolutionary strategy that's at work here. Um, in that video, you saw that a couple of honeybees were were killed by the hornet. Um, but that's a small price to pay. Um, when if that scout is able to return to its hive and then bring a bunch of its sisters with it, um, then that hive would essentially be completely destroyed. Okay. And so this idea of this is going to hurt you a lot more than, than it hurts me is, is what is the process that it's at, at work here. Okay. Uh, so still talking about coevolution, not all coevolution is predator and prey based. It's not always the situation of, you know, death and destruction. Um, but there can be other examples of coevolution. And here is a picture of a honeybee orchid. Um, and I also have a video of, of this orchid um, on eCampus. So pause and uh, take a look at that video and then come back and then we'll talk about uh, what you just saw. Pretty cool, right? So, <clears throat> um, you know, this is, this is an example of uh, coevolution, which uh, results in uh, a relatively benign, um, a relatively benign cost to the bee. Um, and there are also lots of examples of flowers and pollinating insects that are mutualistic, that result in the pollinator getting something out of um, uh, uh, the encounter with the flower. In this case, the uh, male honeybees don't really, don't really get a whole lot out of this. Um, but in many other cases, and we can see it all around us with flowers and, and pollinators. The flower, the plant is offering up some sugar, some nectar, or some pollen uh, in exchange for uh, the uh, pollinating insect's ability to fly from flower to flower um, and pass on its pollen. Okay, And so these co-evolutionary um, relationships are really important. It's another reason why this particular co-evolutionary um, relationship is is really important and is also really scary when we think about honeybees because honeybees do a lot of pollinate, pollinating of the plants that we eat. So, you know, things like corn, things like wheat, things like soybeans, um, things like uh, apples and the fruit trees and things like that that we eat are pollinated by honeybees and other, other flying insects. So a loss of those organisms will make things really difficult for human beings. Um, and so this is a mutualistic relationship that we need to be very careful to, to try to preserve. Okay. And so in thinking about, you know, all of the observations that Darwin and Wallace were making, um, uh, we can think about sexual selection. Okay. Um, and he was trying to explain why uh, some of the characteristics that he saw in certain organisms, particularly in male organisms, were so extravagant and so conspicuous. Um, and so he proposed the theory of sexual selection in the late 19th century, in the late 1800s. Um, and he uh, sort of conceived of it this way, that the choosy sex drives selection for traits in the non-choosy sex. And so one of the things that he was observing uh, was that uh, a lot of male species, uh, a lot of males within species um, were mating with as many different females as he as as the males possibly could. Right. Um, and they were displaying to any female that would that would walk by or come by and um, try to get that female to mate. And he would mate with that female as many times uh, as or many different females as he possibly could. He also made the observation, and often, and well, as we'll find out, this is an incorrect observation, that once the female mated with a male, then she went off and, um, you know, had her babies, and that was it, and she was done. 
side. And he also observed that the females were the ones that were coming by and deciding whether or not they were going to mate with a male, which is why the male would have to jump around or dance around or prove himself in some way. And so in Darwin's mind, the choosy sex became females and the non-choosy sex became males. And so the thing that explains peacock tails, these long extravagant tails that are very pretty, um, but also make those peacocks very vulnerable, much more vulnerable to predation um, and much more conspicuous to predators. Um, you know, Darwin was like, well, why, why would this seemingly physically maladaptive trait have evolved unless it confers some uh, differential uh, success in reproduction? And so the idea with, with you know, male displays that are that would otherwise make it very difficult for those males to survive is that it became a signal for male health, for, for male, uh, for, for strong traits and strong genes, right? So if a male can afford to have uh, this big extravagant tail, he must be really good at surviving because he's definitely physically more weak, or physically more vulnerable to predation. So if he's able to carry this burden of this big, big tail, he's got to be super strong. Um, in order to 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 survive that. And so that was Darwin's idea that females are driving the uh, presence of these traits in the population. And so there's a number of examples of sexual dimorphism, as I mentioned before, the difference in traits. And so here's, you know, here's a peacock, right? This big conspicuous bird that is advertising that it, it wants to mate. But it's also advertising to predators that it's available. Okay, so how would this evolve and why would this evolve? And Darwin said, oh, it's got to be the females. The females love the big, extravagant, colorful tails. Another example um, is a, uh, here's a picture of a black buck antelope and the uh, brown, brown or tannish female in the, in the background and the um, very high contrasted dark, dark brown to black male in the foreground with horns, right? And so, you know, what would be the reason why these these traits would evolve? As you can imagine, the, the females blend into the environment a lot easier and a lot better than the males do. Same principle. We can look at things like bighorn sheep, right? These big ornate um, horns that are, are a sign of, of, of male health. Here's a bird of paradise, um, the uh, male bird of paradise. I don't don't remember what species this is, but you can see it's very, very brightly colored, very extravagant. And so again, very conspicuous to, to predators, but because they are uh, putting themselves out there in such a big way, they must be good survivors. At least that's what Darwin's thinking was. Okay. And so we see examples of this in other animal species, but we also see examples of this in human populations, in males advertising their virility, their, their ability to um, you know, be, be good, be good mates. And so we have, um, tribal folks in, um, Papua New Guinea. Okay. With a penis gourd. And it does exactly what you think it's designed to do. It's supposed to advertise this male's, um, attractiveness and their, and their virility. Okay. But it's also important to recognize that there are elements of this, the same sort of male display in all human populations and all human cultures. Um, and so, you know, we have a, a contemporary example here of some truck nuts. OK, and why else would you put testicles on a truck except to advertise, you know, some sense of maleness, um, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, but other examples in, you know, modern human cultures, right? Bodybuilding, right? This idea of having these huge exaggerated muscles. And so we can see, you know, or, uh, ornamentation on the body, uh, ornamentation on different objects, other examples of sort of male displays and not, and of course, not just males, but it's, it's definitely more prevalent in male populations, right? Dressing up one's automobile and having all of these things to say like, Hey, look at me and come, come ride with me, those sorts of things. Okay. And all the way up to, um, you know, huge extravagant things like a, uh, a, a, a yacht with a helicopter pad in the back. And this is actually the yacht of, um, Lex Wexner, who is, um, a billionaire who owns, uh, I think it's Victoria's secrets and the gap and the limited, like stupendous, ridiculous uh 
amounts of money. And if you can see the the name on that on this yacht uh, is limitless, right? And so what what other <laughs> What other purpose could all of these things, all of these ornate, exaggerated um, things serve other than to advertise one's um, wealth, one's ability to provide, one's, um, you know, what have you, one's success, I suppose. OK, um, and so we see examples of this, you know, throughout the animal kingdom um, of males, mostly males advertising their their ability to to have resources and, and to provide, okay? Um, and so when we think about the choosier sex, and again, I'm keeping the choosier sex in quotation marks because we're gonna disrupt this, at least in human populations, um, in a bit. But why is it typically females? And so, so moving beyond Darwin, evolutionary biologists were attempting to think of why, why, why was it that females were the ones who were typically choosing in um, sexually reproducing uh, species. And so why is it typically females? Well, it's it's hypothesized that it's all about the gametes. And so these are things that we know to be true in most species um, that, you know, egg cells tend to be much, 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 much larger than sperm cells. And in human beings, the egg, the, the ovum um, is the only human cell that you can see with a naked eye. Um, compare that to sperm cells, there's just really no comparison, right? Um, and so sperm cells are much, much smaller than egg cells. And so per reproductive opportunity, um, females are producing their, their uh, sex cells are just so much larger. And because they're so much larger, there's more energetic investment per uh, gamete, per cell. Um, another characteristic that led evolutionary biologists to, to hypothesize that um, females are the choosier sex is that males tend to produce far more gametes than females. Um, you know, in, again, in human beings, the, your, your average human male will produce more sperm in a, a couple of hours, in half a day, than, your, uh, your, uh, than a human female will produce in her entire lifetime, right? And so uh, another reason why females, it was hypothesized that females tend to be choosier because they don't have as many chances to reproduce as males do, okay? And so the consequences of the, the differential size in gametes and the differential, reper the, the differential uh, number of gametes produced is that females tend to judge while males tend to compete, right? Um, and oftentimes that competition can be violent and deadly, the physical competition between, between males. And an example of this are elephant seals, as I mentioned before. Um, and for elephant seals, the stakes of competition between males are very high because the male, the, the winner of this bloody, um, this battle of, of essentially bloody knuckles, but it happens at... Uh, with with their tusks and on the throats and and chests of these uh, elephant seals, the winner of this fight um, gets almost exclusive access to mating with females on the beach, and we're talking hundreds, potentially hundreds of females. Um, and so, oftentimes, these battles, these fights, um, turn deadly, right? Because the stakes are so so high. Okay, and so for you know, decades, this idea that the choosier sex uh, was females and that this is how things work for all um, for all uh, sexually reproducing organisms, particularly mammals and also particularly human beings, was the dominant narrative, right? This is just how things are. This evolutionary biology explains this. Um, but there are there there is plenty of, of evidence that disrupts this hypothesis. OK, um, and one of the evolutionary biologists who offered an alternative hypothesis to sexual selection as, and was and has been critical of this is Joan Rothgarden, uh, who is a Stanford University biologist. Um, and her um, sort of initial disruption uh, of this idea of sexual selection, this idea that females are choosy and males compete, um, uh, came from her 
observing that sexual selection was a product of, of a paternalistic Victorian ideology. Okay, and this is why it's so important for sci the sciences to be in conversation with the social sciences. And as we've talked about early on in the semester, there are, oops, sorry, a fly flew into my, into my glasses. Um, as we've talked about early, or earlier on in the semester, that many of the, of the mostly men, mostly white men who um, have set the foundation of hypotheses and theory within this field and most fields um, are also not immune to the ways in which they are socialized to think about uh, maleness, the way they're socialized to think about um, womanness and these sorts of things. And so their, I, the cultural ideas seep into the ways in which they frame the theory. And so, you know, Joan Rothgarten observed that the way in which Darwin thought about uh, sexual selection and sexual reproduction in the ways that many other uh, evolutionary biologists thought about these issues look very, very similar to the ways in which um, their cultures viewed gender roles and viewed the ways the roles of men and women and what men and women should be doing and are, are uh, believed to naturally be uh, predisposed to. But what Rothgarden observed is and proposed as an alternative was social selection. And we'll talk about the, um, the evidence for that. And that traits and behaviors around reproduction, sexual reproduction, were, were not the result of, of this fierce competition between males, but the result of communication and cooperation. Right? And so the, the, the traits that we've observed in different species and in human beings are the result of communications between the sexes and cooperation between the sexes. Because it's not just a situation, it's not always and just a situation where the male mates with as many females as he possibly can and the females um, you know, only mate with one male and, and stay loyal to that male. That, that idea tracks very, very closely with Victorian ideology. Um, and is not borne out in the evidence, okay? And so Rothgarden used game theory to explain sexual behaviors and traits, and we're not going to go into the, um, the nitty-gritty of game theory, um, but essentially what it is is a, a complex sort of... Um, a complex blueprint of interactions um, that result in the ways in which different actors within a system communicate and cooperate or don't cooperate, right? And so essentially, uh, Rothgarten's hypothesis was like it's much more complex than these strict um, sexual characteristics that aren't always present. Um, and so the question becomes, you know, which is correct, right? Is it social selection that influences the, the traits that are involved in, in sexual reproduction or is it sexual selection? Um, and so, you know, as one might imagine, it's explaining sexual behavior and traits um, is at the intersection of biology and social theory, right? In order to explain this, in order to explain what we're seeing, and in order to deal with all of the evidence and all of the observations that have been made um, in sexual reproduction across species, we biology can't be the only thing. It, it, it's not sufficient to explain uh, many of the things that we're seeing. Um, and so it gets complicated, right? And biologists have been you know, reluctant to accept Rough Garden's hypothesis um, for reasons of the evidence is still being gathered, you know, it's still being tested, uh, but, but also because it disrupts kind of a dominant narrative. And we know from history that um, dominant narratives, people oftentimes resist uh, changing or, or updating or, or no longer following dominant narratives, not because there isn't enough evidence to say that we must move on to a different way of thinking, but because it makes the folks uh, uncomfortable to, to do so. Okay, And so historians and philosophers of science are finding this question, um, I think, m maybe more compelling than um, evolutionary biologists, but it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing um, conversation. So, Let's discuss some evidence against sexual selection, right? And so remember, like, s sexual selection um, theory suggests that or should result in males being um, wildly um, and broadly promiscuous, having, having 
sex with as many different females as possible. And females should be uh, extremely loyal to one male, the strongest male, and shouldn't be um, mating with other males. Um, and so right off the bat, when we think about this in terms of human beings, we know that that isn't supported by the evidence, right? And so, you know, sexual selection predicts ma females should be choosy and, and loyal to attractive males. But one of the bits of evidence against this is not just in humans, but in lots of different species, is that females are just as promiscuous in many species as males are. Um, and so, you know, it's been a, it had been a dominant narrative that particularly in bird species that birds mate for life and they don't they don't um, change their mates and they stay together until until they until death do they part. Um, and in some species, that's more or less true. Um, but there's a lot of genetic evidence that, um, that there, that there's not a lot of monogamy, uh, sexual monogamy in birds, even, even birds who have even a male and a female bird who are building a nest together and are raising their chicks together. Um, you know, the females have been observed to mate with other males sort of in the area, um, and not just the male that they're building a nest with. Okay. Um, and so that's one bit of evidence, um, female cryptic choice. Okay. Um, so there are ways that, uh, females, even in the process of mating can essentially, um, prevent, uh, fertilization of, of their eggs. And one example of this is, um, the, the vaginal canals of, of, of ducks. Okay. They have dead ends. And so one of the sort of more unpleasant characteristics of ducks is that their reproduction is very violent. Um, males um, sort of attack females and mate with them and to uh, get around and to avoid females uh, being fertilized by males that they, that they don't want, um, their, their, their uh, reproductive canals have, have evolved um, uh, dead ends to prevent the deposit of sperm in the uh, on the ovum if the female so chooses. The females don't have the physical ability to always fight off the male ducks, and so they have sort of gotten around that by having dead ends within their own bodies to prevent males from uh, fertilizing their eggs if they don't want to. Um, and that's also led to kind of an evolutionary arms race between the, the size of uh, duck penises and the size of duck vaginas. And if you um, want to see what that's led to, uh, as you can imagine, as the the female, duck female um, reproductive canals, a cloaca canal has evolved more complexity and, and more dead ends, uh, duck penises have gotten absolutely humongous. And so um, Google, not at work, but Google duck penis, and you can see that Duck, pen duck penises are actually um, so long that many of them are actually longer than the, the bird itself. And that's, be that's the result of this um, co-evolution um, between um, duck females and duck, duck males. Okay? Um, and so this idea, the other idea that sexual selection predicts is that the more attractive mates have better genes. Right? So this idea that the the peacock who has this huge ornate tail has the has the best genes, right? That the offspring of this particular male that's able to survive and, and have this really, really attractive um, uh, tail, that male's offspring are going to be the most successful ones. They're going to be the healthiest. They're going to be the strongest. And in fact, that that's not the case. Um, there's lots of evidence to suggest that there's there's a very loose correlation between the trait that's popular and the traits that are and the genes that are beneficial. Right. So it may be that, you know, the large male that's able to dominate all the other males um, and produce other large males, that might not be a beneficial trait in the genes okay, or in the environment. Um, and the other evidence against um, sexual selection is that you know, the environmental conditions are constantly in flux. Um, and so there may not be time for females to find a mate that, they, that would be ideal to them. 
Um, and so there may not be time or, or space or resources for a female to be choosy. It could be a particularly bad year um, and that rather than being choosy, the female just has to mate and reproduce because that's that's the drive. Um, and so it may not always be up to the female to have to be in a space where uh, she can make a choice and choose from the best from the best males that are there, or what she might think of the best males that are there. OK. All right. And so, the, you know, there's a lot of evidence in, in other species uh, to suggest that sexual selection may not be um, always at, at least always at play, but oftentimes maybe not be at play at all. Um, and so we can think about this in terms of sexual behavior in human beings. Right. And so, again, sexual selection predicts that women should be choosy and not promiscuous and that males should be indis should mate indiscriminately with as many females as they possibly can. Um, and so one of the evidence, one of the bits of evidence against this um, idea in um, human human populations, besides the obvious, besides the fact that, um, you know, studies show that women are just as promiscuous as men um, and that, uh, you know, the rates of promiscuity are, are relatively uh, equal. But another another thing that we observe when the uh, females of a species of a, of a species are not promiscuous and the males mate indiscriminately with females is that um, there's dramatic sexual dimorphism so we can think about elephant seals but we can think about our evolutionary cousins that are much more closely related to us with in terms of gorillas okay um, and so in in both of those mammal species the males are many 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 times larger than the females and the reason for this is that the males have to have this physical competition in order to determine who mates with the majority of the females. And so in that case, we see that the females of those species tend not to be promiscuous and that the males mate indiscriminately with as many females as they possibly can. But in other species like human beings, where there is there is sexual dimorphism, on average, males tend to be larger they tend to be have more muscle mass and they tend to be um um yeah they tend to be larger and have more muscle mass um <clears throat> we don't observe um this sort of indiscriminate mating of males and this um you know very very loads of rates of promiscuity in females okay and so you know if human beings follow this sexual selection behavior as outlined by Darwin, we would expect human males to be, you know, two to three to four times the size of uh, human females on average, and that's just not the case. And so that leads that leads us, and that leads um, other, you know, people who study human sexual behavior to say, well, wait a minute, maybe maybe there's a different type of sexual behavior, sexual model in humans. Okay, um, and so many human societies hold sexual selection as doctrine, right, for explaining human sexuality. Um, and that is because of the ways in which the people who came up with the idea of sexual selection um, are part of the dominant culture that sort of set these cultural expectations, right? So we can think about um, the ways in which men in, um, human, in, in many human societies are socialized to think about um, heterosexual um, uh, relationships or heterosexual encounters and the ways in which w human women are, human females are, are socialized to think about um, uh, human uh, sexual, sexual relationships, right? And certainly if you were born and, and raised in the United States, um, the, we have been socialized to think of things the way that Darwin thought of sexual selection in human beings. Um, but as we've just discussed, that way of thinking is actually not really grounded in any physical evidence or scientific evidence. It's more grounded in the ways in which um, Dar the, the culture that Darwin came from and the culture that, that dominates the United States uh, conceived of these sorts of things. And so this, this is sort of a representation of rationality. So, you know, is this doctrine that males tend to be promiscuous and females tend to not to be promiscuous, is that really based in evolutionary history and, and, and evolutionary evidence? Or is there something else going on, right? How do we explain this? How do we explain, you know, the presence of this idea in culture, but the lack of evidence to support it in 
um, the evolutionary uh, and biological evidence? And so that's a really important question that um, this person right here, Dr. Christopher Ryan, um, uh, wrote about and talked about, okay? And so the third video that I want you all to pause and uh, look at is this very important um, discussion of the evolution of sexual behavior in human beings that talks about some of the themes that we've, that we've mentioned here, okay? So once again, I want you to pause the lecture um, and go and watch this video and then come back and we'll talk about it in a little bit. And remember that this video is actually one of the assigned ones for this week. So you really want to make sure that you listen to this, take some notes and think about it. And then I'll see you in, in uh, a couple of minutes after it's done. Okay. Okay. Welcome back. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really important, really important video. And again, like if there are any questions or things that come up with any of these videos or things are not quite clear, please do send me an email or come to office hours. All right, so let's talk about what Dr. Ryan said um, and sort of wrap up this, this topic, right? And so the evidence points to social selection in human beings. As, as Dr. Ryan outlined in his talk, you know, this idea that, that human males um, have have some sort of control or have some sort of right over human female um, uh, promiscuity and, and sexual autonomy is a very recent, very new um, idea that is born out of, uh, particularly in this part of the world, that's born out of European colonization, a particular cultural value that Europeans carried, Western Europeans carried to other parts of the world um, and imposed on the people that are there. And that's the dominant system that we have. But uh, there's really only the only evidence to support the validity of that is within the people who have uh, come up with the idea, but it's not supported in the, in the physical evidence. And, and so our history, our evolutionary history, our current anatomy points to general promiscuity among the sexes, between the sexes, and that females and males are just as are, are equally as promiscuous Um and, um, you know, that the shift, as I mentioned, is a very recent shift away from promiscuity. And there are all sorts of sort of cultural norms that have been in place to design to that fit more uh, in line with the way in which we uh, as a species have evolved. OK, and so, you know, this the shift to controlling female sexual autonomy, this this um, the need of populations to control who. Uh, females were, or who, who women were, were reproducing with um, is a very recent thing, okay? And it's likely the result of industrial agricultural civilization. This idea that um, boundaries were, were being put up and it's less of a, of a premium was put on um, cooperation and more about drawing boundaries around territory and building up one's resources and dominating others, which is a... a uh, a mindset that came came from industrial based agriculture so a shift away from cooperation to kind of individual private property these sorts of things uh, very likely resulted in the need to control sexual human sexual human female sexual behavior um, because it was important for men who are taking the taking control of the way that society functioned that they knew who their offspring were right you didn't want to spend time and resources, um, gathering uh, and growing uh, resources, and then passing it on to um, individuals who are not part of your family, right? Okay, and so this is a very recent, very recent thing. So some conclusions on sexual selection: um, the you know the original idea lacks the overwhelming evidence that uh, let's say evolution by natural selection has, or mutations have, or genetic drift has. And so sexual selection is not considered a scientific theory. It is a scientific hypothesis, but it's not a theory because it doesn't have the overwhelming evidence. Um, and so that lack of evidence begs the question of, well, why is this a thing? Why has this been a thing? And of course, as Dr. Ryan pointed out, and as we've talked about, that evidence is based in, or that the evidence is based in culture, the cultural ideas. So was Darwin making the same mistakes as his peers, as Buffon, as uh, some of the other uh, European scientists who were making value judgments based on their culture and not uh, 
their evidence and then using their cultural explanations to justify um, their, their pseudoscience conclusions. Okay? And so modeling sexual behavior is very complicated, uh, it's very difficult to do, um, and it's ongoing. All right, so the, the scientific evidence for social selection is ongoing and currently, you know, being researched. And so it's an important thing to keep your eye on. Um, and that sexual behavior in human beings is, is very culturally malleable. You know, we can look across different cultures and see all sorts of, of, of configurations of, of what constitutes family, what constitutes uh, relationships, what constitutes intimacy, all of these things. And so it's really important to, to recognize that fact, that there, there isn't a kind of a, a universal set of, of characteristics in the ways in which human beings relate to each other sexually. Um, and so there's very little bi biological evidence for the choosy female promiscuous male model um, outside of agricultural-based civilizations. Okay, So that's a really important thing uh, to take home and to remember when we're talking about and discussing sexual selection. And hopefully it um, disrupts this idea that um, we uh, that that many of us are socialized to believe this choosy female promiscuous male model because as Dr. Ryan um, pointed out it leaves no room for um, uh, uh, similar or similar gender uh, sexual relationships um, queer relationships these sorts of things. There's no space for that, and we can see in many societies that um, members of the LGBTQIA community have been left out of these conversations of what's appropriate ways to relate to each other sexually and, and in relationships. Um, and, you know, it just sort of it creates a lot of problems and issues because, as Dr. Hi uh, Ryan hypothesizes, that this um, Darwin's model and this Victorian paternalistic model goes against... Um, the ways in which human beings evolve to relate to each other in this particular way. Okay, so hopefully we'll continue to you know we continue to think about that and, and disrupt those those kinds of narratives, both from a cultural perspective and a um, biological perspective. All right. So the question of this week, as we're moving from kind of the micro evolution, the the finer details of how uh, changes in allele frequencies in a population over time happen to talking about sort of these big, more obvious changes and talking about macroevolution and, and species is, I'd like for you to answer this question, what is a species? Uh, and again, don't use a textbook definition, um, just in your own mind, right now, as you're listening to this, what do you consider a species? Okay, so uh, click on the link in eCampus and get on um, uh, the Google Drive and answer that question. All right, last slide, a couple of reminders. Uh, there's no reflection due for the Corona Sode episode podcast. As uh, I mentioned in an email over the weekend, um, there was a snafu in which I listened to and built the rubric off of a earlier Corona Sode episode, and I had you all listen to the updated one, okay? And so everyone gets full credit for that first uh, reflection, so, you know, no expectation that you have completed that assignment. Don't worry about it. Um, but I still expect you uh, have listened to that episode, okay? And so the question on the exam that's going to come from the podcast will come from the episode that I have listed on eCampus, all right? So don't just blow it off. You know, don't just say, oh, I'm not going to listen to that. It's not going to be on the exam or I, I shouldn't listen to it because, it, you know, Dr. Hall isn't asking me to do so. Please do listen to that episode. It's fair game on the exam. And um, it's a it's a good it's a good episode to to know. You get some knowledge on, on the coronavirus. All right. Uh, also, remember that there's two assigned media for this week. There's one video, the Dr. Ryan video, which you should have already watched. Um, and then there's a paper. Uh, discussing um, Dr. Rothgarden's um, uh, work, and that paper is the um, the the piece, the assignment for this week that the reflection is based on. Okay, so make sure you're doing both of those things um, and staying up to date on that. And uh, this week there will be uh, two organisms of the week because if you notice, I didn't didn't post one uh, for last week. Last week was a rough week, as I mentioned before, for me, um, so trying to get caught up on things. But, um, yeah, so make sure you're staying up on assignments. Um, uh, 
you know, if there's any questions, we're starting to pick up speed with the material here um, and it's getting a little bit more complex. So please do check in via email or during uh, Zoom office hours Wednesday from 1.30 to 2.30. All right. I hope you all have a good week. Um, uh, please stay safe. Please uh, check on each other. Um, and uh, I'll see you all uh, at office hours or next week. Thanks.